Good day, friends. Hi, my name's Eli, and I'm a community manager at TechSoup. And today I'm super excited to bring you a webinar on creating a culture of security. We're presenting this webinar in partnership with our friends at the Communities Foundation of Texas. If you're a nonprofit working in Texas, they're going to help make sure that you're connected to a community and resources to help you thrive and succeed. Let me tell you about our guest experts. We've got two amazing people here with us. We've got Aaron Dowell, who is your advocate and champion for anything to do with TechSoup and specifically our quad community. So say you're trying to say, is my organization actually eligible for that awesome security product in the TechSoup catalog or that service offering? Well, you can actually reach out directly to Aaron by email and get like direct support there. So. If the website is confounding you a little bit, don't worry. You've got a human there to cover you and make sure that you're on the right path. But speaking of humans who are going to make sure you're on the right path, we also got here Michael Enox. Michael is a senior technical director at TechSoup, where he manages the community and platform. And what that really means is he's actually responsible for TechSoup's infrastructure and security. So he makes sure that all of our internal and external teams are set up with the right tools and the right approach and the right cultural mindset to make sure that they're operating effectively, efficiently, and securely. Let's give it up for Michael Enos. All right. Hello, everyone. Listen, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about security, specifically cybersecurity, and I'll go through, through the whole sort of kind of agenda. But especially one thing that I just wanted to call out is that when we talk about Security, there's basically, sometimes we talk about data security. We also sometimes talk about data privacy. Data privacy is a different topic, and I'm not going to be going into data privacy so much as I'm going to be focusing on data security, which is essentially the effort to make sure the data is secure. There's another effort has to occur within an organization to make sure that it's private. That's why we all have privacy policies on our website. That's why we have contracts and stuff. We're a third party processor. And, and that work is done side by side. I have a counterpart at TechSoup, an amazing individual who's, who, who's an expert in data privacy. And between us and our legal department at TechSoup, we cover the sorts of things of compliance and governance when it comes to security and such. Before you too far, I'm going to cover basically the agenda here. Basically, we're going to start with, I'm just going to give myself a kind of a brief introduction about my background and especially the context. And then we're going to talk about the threat that organization that, that we see in the sector and why it is so important for civil society to, to, to really create programs to help them improve their security posture and also govern it and also train staff. And then we're going to talk about the guiding, what we call a, a framework, cybersecurity framework. And we're going to discuss that because it, this isn't Michael making you know, a step up for TechSoup, right? So. We all need guidance, just in a similar way that lawyers look to the law or accounting team look to general accounting principles, but we have our own standards by which we measure ourselves. And our organization and many other organizations use NIST, and we'll talk about that in detail. In fact, a lot of it, what we're talking about today is how TechSoup applies the NIST framework to our own. And, and hence, the, the, the following topic after that will be essentially TechSoup, our own sort of case study in terms of how we, we employ these things. It looks as though my video is frozen. Is that correct? Oh, there it goes. Okay. And uh, so anyway, and then we're going to basically, I've, I've got some links and stuff to some resources for y'all. So essentially, my background, as I introduced, is essentially that I direct our DevOps our enterprise infrastructure and our security program. I also work closely with the software development teams at TechSoup and the different platforms and, and such that you see underlying supporting infrastructure that we host in, in various places. And it, TechSoup is very large, has a very large tech, technical ecosystem that spans the entire globe. We have over a thousand servers and in, in multiple different data centers providing these services to our, not just us in the U S but also to our partners. Wide. And so it's quite a, a lot of moving parts. And so there's a lot to cover, but also with a small team, like any other sort of organization, you have 
that the nonprofit, Texas does have limited resources. So we do what we can with the resources we have. So we have to be organized in this. The, the, a little bit about my background prior to where I've been with TechSoup for about 10 years now in this role. And prior to that, I spent 15 years as the chief technology officer for uh, Technarvis Food Bank in Silicon Valley. So, so those who know the, the Bay Area or, or the are familiar with food banks, especially the food bank in in the Bay Area, it's one of the largest food banks in the country. And so with that, I work very closely with Feeding America on helping them develop technology for food banking and security and also data research. In, in that capacity, I learned a lot about the needs of nonprofits and especially in the food security sector. And then of course, it working out tech soup, I'm seeing working with organizations in all parts of civil society and really to try to understand and also help the community. And so in, in my in my title, the community part is the part where, what, what I'm doing now in terms of, in, in terms of discussing things, writing blogs, doing webinars and things for our community. That's why I'm the director of community and the platform, and the platform of course, is the technology. Anyway, moving on, I mean, why is this important for the nonprofit sector or NGOs? Sometimes we just use words, civil society organizations, GSOs. Essentially, as an organization, we're susceptible to the same thing any other organization is, whether it be a government or a private sector business, or we have to do the same mechanism. Cybersecurity, cyber threats aren't necessarily, sometimes they're targeted, but sometimes they're not. Many times they're not. In fact, most of them are not. Most of them is just people trying to find something and something valuable, something that they can get a hold of some value. And it's pretty non-script in terms of threat actors and where they're looking. And so what they do is essentially they scan, they just scan systems, they scan the internet constantly. I've got a data slide where I'm going to show you the extent at which our own organization is being constantly bombarded with people looking for something to uncover, some risk that they could be exposed. But what's important about civil society is that in my view, I believe civil society is part of the critical infrastructure of the fabric of the entire world. Without civil society organization, the world would not operate the way it does. If you think about it in that context, we are critical infrastructure and hence our data is part of that critical infrastructure. It needs to be shepherded and stewarded. When, for example, when I worked at the food bank, we had access to donor information from its weird Silicon Valley, some of the wealthiest people in California. And at the same time, we had access to the information of all the vulnerable populations that we serve. So he were, here we were sitting with data of two different, of both of extreme magnitude in terms of its sensitivity and having to figure out how to protect this stuff because there's all, all kinds of reasons why people wouldn't want to get the information on vulnerable populations. And also why they want to get information and data on, on people who are being philanthropic. And obviously the result of some sort of something that can happen are through the result of malware or phishing or is essentially you can end up in a situation where your website is hot and you need to pay some coin amount in order to try to unlock it or work with lawyers and and that could be that you lose faith in your your communities essentially and the trust of them especially because the data breach and their data is lost and you have to go and really communicate to people that there's been some effort and we've all seen those emails we've all seen the news headlines and it's interesting that even some of the most you know, sophisticated tech companies will sometimes have just a crack somewhere and somebody will wedge into that crack and then open it up. And I'm not trying to scare anybody, but essentially that is the reality. And so we, what we have to do is we have to do our best effort to protect that because we do have a responsibility as being the stewards of data in order to, to help that. And please, as I go through this, it fed me just being a talking head here. Please, you like I said earlier, please suggest things and I could all be interrupted so that I can then ad address it as a question as it comes up. Eli, we good? Everybody can, you guys can all hear me okay? Rock solid. Keep going. Excellent. Fantastic. Just like to check in. So essentially these things are pretty best. So anyway, the one I want to show you here is actually what we see it, it, in our perimeter. Okay. So TechSoup.org. Obviously, it's our U.S. progenization site, but we also have, you know, a whole bunch of these all over the world that are TechSoup partners, like TechSoup Canada, Kenya, basically every, almost in every plate except for the embargo states, TechSoup has some representation uh, to help 
distribute the philanthropy of our donors and also to help our impact and through things like this, through other types of resources and educational materials. What we're seeing, for example, this is a seven day snapshot and in seven days snapshot, you can see that basically there were, we had 60,000 requests blocked to people trying to get to techsheep.org in seven days. Of those, you can see the way it breaks down. SQL injection is the type of exploit that people try to get in to try to see if they can get hold of a database, like a SQL database. And, and so that's, and so we have, what you're seeing here is a tool that we call a web application firewall. And we have web application firewalls in front of all of our websites that have critical data inside them. And we do that because with just like your regular firewall that you would have in your network, this provides a firewall against people who are exactly trying to do this. And so it, it senses it, uses really smart analytics to monitor this and prevent it. And fortunately it, it worked. As you can see, basically this is the sort of stuff that we're seeing a lot of it. It's just bot, bot activity. People just stuff flying it at the website. The reason why we'll go into this, this important having something like this is also because we get to a great performance. As you see down here, we had something called a, we actually had one denial of service attack or attempted attack. And that's a distributed denial of service. You may have heard of those. It because of what they're trying to do is trying to hit the website. So bounce with something that actually just brings it down, knocks it offline. The cross-site scripting is, is another type of type of exploit, attempted exploit. You can see these other ones where people are just trying to get access. So this gives you some indication. You can actually see where, where they're coming from. So there's a heat map here. And because we can see the IP address, you can see that these things are coming from all over the world. And oftentimes these are organized just, it could be everything from a, a teenager. And it's not sort of trying to see what's out there on the internet, or it could be something as sophisticated as a nation state actor operating out of labor farms and in, in another country and one of the embargo states. This is what we see here. This is what the internet looks like from a security perspective. That's just the internet. And then of course we have the issue that has to do with perhaps somebody clicking on a link in an email, right? That they say that most, most security events happen because of human error, like an internal error, not necessarily this, although either way, it's, you have to work both the inter internal security, mostly around security awareness and understanding, but also things like using uh, encryption, VPN. And other things that we'll get go into a little bit when we get when we start walking through the framework. So just moving on here, the one of the things that I'm going to be discussing here is essentially the as I mentioned earlier, NIST as a cybersecurity framework. And the reason why we want to use a framework when creating policy, creating practices in an organization is because, like I said earlier, we need to use the, the guidance from it's the chief and leadership body. And for people who did to, there's lots of effort and research that goes into this from a, from institutions like NIST, which stands for the National Institute of Security and Technology, Standards and Technology. And there's other ones, there's other government ones and there's other private ones, essentially all kinds of resources out there, but we've settled on NIST as an organization as a, for our methodology and we will go into the details of how NIST works now. Um, but especially the reason why we do this is, as I mentioned earlier, we're stewards of data reflecting the critical research of civil society and it's our duty and responsibility to do what we can within the resources that we have in order to, you know, try to mitigate and any sort of possible threat that can come our way. Well, another reason why we do this, obviously, is because it's audit controls. Audit controls are based on the standard. For example, if you were to go through a cybersecurity audit by a, a cyber insurance company, you're trying to get cyber insurance. What they're going to do is they're going to ask you questions based on the standard. And so by using the standards to then guide your policies, you can say, oh, because they're going to ask, do you have a backup and disaster policy? You can say, yes, I do, because that's one of the things that NIST talks about. Or do you have a security incident? policy and you do pride security awareness training to your staff. They're, they're gonna, they ask those questions during the third party audit, whether that be from a, a insurance provider or sometimes another authority could come in depending on the circumstances of the organization. Um, and sometimes organizations will obviously, which is always a good practice, 
look to an organization um, like like Tech Impact or something to actually help them do an assessment so that they can then understand that. And then actually have a third party assessment done so that they could really find out where, where they land with that. Elaborate. Yeah, actually, I really like that recommendation of uh, having one of these third party assessments. And I'll share a link actually in the chat in a moment about actually a new service from TechSoup with partnership for Tech Impact. But that, that sort right. of gives you that first level. Of what is the level of risk we're actually, we have right now? And right. what are some of the next steps we would take on? I also have a really timely question coming here from Randy Coleman, who asked, is the NISC 800-53 Rev 5 a good yeah. resource? And obviously, did we catch you out there? Or is that something that rings a bell to you? That's actually what I'm going to be going into right now. So. Ah. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, that is a great reference. And that is the, the they, they have ways to understand it in ways that are, that are a little bit more. You can go through the entire document. It's heavy reading. And, but if you're like me, I like to do that kind of stuff. But if you, there's also just more, they break it down into more just guiding principles and also controls that those standards are based on. But yes, that is the, for, for us, that is the gold standard by which we try to measure ourselves. Of. It's like the ruler by which we measure ourselves, put it that way. And I think we all need rulers to measure ourselves, our performance, our policy. And what it does is it gives you something to go to your leadership, to the your board of directors and say, look, these are the gaps. We, we just looked at, I just gone through this NIST framework and we have some gaps and we need resources or funding or to seek a grant to help us implement this. And I've worked with organizations that have gone, that's the thing they've done. They said, look, we need a security program, but we don't have the resources to do that. And then we'll go get funding for that. And because organizations see that's a capacity building exercise for an organization. It's not operational costs just to add more budget. It's actually a, a project-based cost to help improve the organizational capacity of the organization. So eventually you have here as described, it, uh, it isn't strict on the website. It's, it's the framework for us to understand how cybersecurity works. And it, and it covers the Five, they were actually on the framework version two, but I didn't, I didn't, I hadn't updated this slide, but it's the same concept. They just changed small bits of the standard, but essentially the essential theme here is that sort of, we see this a lot in, in, in business plan, do you check act, plan, do you check act, sort of cycle, right? In this case, what we're seeing here in that sort of cycle is we're seeing identify, um, the risk, protect your organization or have mechanisms to identify, have mechanisms, protect your organization's data. And then also to detect it so that if it's something does happen, you, you know, it's happening. And then also to respond to something when it does happen, because chances are things are going to happen. It's something you just have to have the ability to respond and then also recover or remediate. Sometimes like in this slide, sometimes I'll combine respond and recover essentially because those are really pretty closely connected and also they're all connected. So it isn't totally delineated. One kind of moves to the next, to the next, to the next to the cycle. I'm going to go into some details about this, essentially breaking down that, this framework, what does it look like when you actually start diving into it? Essentially, this is another high level version of it, where it discusses the sort of different relative aspects of each one of these and the basically some, uh, guidance in terms of what are the basic things you need to do. I can really go into a little bit more detail on the next slide. And also I'm going to talk about how tech suit, what we do in each one of these things a little bit. Eventually, you know, you can see here that a lot of times what we're focusing on here in the identify are things like access control or understanding who has access. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a bit. Protecting, obviously there's all kinds of ways to protect your systems, depending on And a lot of this is going to be individualized for each organization and prioritized. For example, if you're an organization that works with a vulnerable population, one of the places where you should be focusing your efforts is really looking at that data, understanding, identifying where it lives, who have access to it and protecting that data. There's some types of data in an organization that is all organizations that's important, but something like, for example, like this, what I'm doing here in this presentation, this PowerPoint slide deck doesn't contain any sensitive information. It's public information. It's something that we want to share with people. It's the opposite of something we want to protect in a way. We want it to get out there and be, be disseminated for information to learn. But if, but so when you, if you think about your systems and such, we have to identify your assets and such. And then by doing that, 
then you could protect them better. And that's why I identify it's happening. And then obviously when we, as we're doing this, we have to be able to detect things. So that's why we're using antivirus as a spyware, as a more program, and also having these alert mechanisms and monitoring mechanisms that are associated with the logs that are being generated by our systems. And there's tools out there that you can use to, to do that. And we're going to talk, we're going to provide some resources around the tools that TechSoup offers and other guidance around. And then of course there's respond, which is essentially what happens if something happens. How do we respond? You don't want to be in a situation where you, something has happened and you don't have a plan or you, you haven't really, you know, thought through a communication plan or a response plan. And it, it, it could be when you're actually in it, that's not the time to be thinking that through because you're going to be that very busy trying to respond and recover essentially, which is going to be essentially ensuring that you've got some remediation plan, something like the, you, you've proven that the backups were, you've tested them, you know, that data is they source somewhere else. And also that you, you use that, this loop to help improve processes and technologies and policies. So diving in just a little bit further, maybe I'll take a break to see if there's any other questions. Eli, are we good? We've got a couple more specific questions. Why don't we okay. dive into those and then we can go back into framework high level stuff. Yeah. So the first question, let's go back to Randy's question, which is he'd love to get a sense from you on some of the tools available to help with continuous monitoring. Do you have a go-to that you think is the thing to start with? Yeah, there's different types of monitoring. Like, for example, anti-bowel by uh, anti-malware programs like Bitdefender and Abast and Norton, which are which are in the TechSoup catalog, um, do do a pretty good job at least in, on the on the device level in terms of saying, "Look, you've got a threat here." But what it doesn't do necessarily is scan uh, to see if you have some outdated version of Chrome browser. Or sometimes some of the more sophisticated tools do. For our servers, we use a product that's not on our catalog, and I'm not endorsing this particular product, but since you asked, we use a tool called Rapid7, which is a, it, there's a, it's a little bit of code that's on our systems, and it's constantly providing analytics. And so we can see, because we're dealing with over a thousand nodes, essentially, we need to be able to see it all in a single pane of glass. We need to be able to look at a screen and see, get a report about, okay, what systems are, don't have, didn't get their security back. Obviously, one of the best ways you can manage and use their devices is to ensure that your patching process is up to date and that systems are automatically patched by whatever operating system you're using. That is a critical sort of aspect of this, but it's, but there is, there is stuff work, different types of tools that do continuous vulnerability and monitoring. They look for CVEs essentially is what they do. Things that are known exploit, sometimes related to code library or the operating systems of the other servers that you're working with. Awesome. I've also got a trio of questions here coming in from Denise. Quick question here. First is, what type of protection should we use for our employees' mobile phones? And I'm going to assume that these are corporately issued phones in this case. Yeah, okay. With, for corporate issued phones, they'd be, they'd be managed by the corporate sort of same, like most most of the systems we use, like Bitcoin and things like that, will actually have software you can run on your phone for, for malware. Also, it will, one of the things we do recommend, also the same thing with VPN for encryption. The, and also if you know, it's probably so if you work, if it's a corporate issue phone, the IT department generally will have something they use called the mobile device management solution for both your phones and your laptop. And what happens is that those go to an inventory. For example, in tune, that probably Office 365, you know, I think you have to have a, a different level of licensing for it, but then you can get Intune, which is especially in uh, Microsoft mobile device management system. You can get all those things in inventory. And if there's an issue, then you'll get an alert and you could also remote wipe it. Now for, but oftentimes what you, since you brought this up, a lot of organizations are moving more towards a way called BYOD policy. Okay. Bring your own device. Cause we can't in a remote work environment post pandemic, there are so many people are working remotely that. You don't know necessarily if you issued somebody a corporate laptop, you don't know if in the next room over, they just don't want to check their email and they're on their own computer. So more and more thinking is going into what we call zero trust, which is essentially the thinking that by creating access mechanisms to get into anything by using multi-factor authentication, 
by using other mechanisms for authentication so that whatever you're accessing knows who you are on a multiple level and it identifies you as an authorized user of this. And then it can also do things like ensure, and then you minimize what can happen with your own device interacting with that. For example, by using malware, it's such that you did, if you did accidentally click on the link, even if it was in your BYO device system, that there'd be some protections against it. So we're trying to think more about zero trust. And that's why it's important, especially as it relates to think about mobile device. Awesome. The next follow-up question for Denise is around basically data in the cloud. And so this is specifically about Google Drive, which is, is it safe with personally identifiable information? And if it isn't, yeah. how can we reduce the threat uh, vulnerabilities? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm glad you brought that up because Steve, I was going to speak a little bit to that. I'll just go ahead and address it now that essentially when you get products such as Office or Google, and let's say you get it from through the nonprofit for Google or the nonprofit for Microsoft program, or if even, or if you're just using it on your own or anything, if you're using Box, Slack, anything like that, we have to assume that when you get those products off, out of the, the shelf, they are configured for security, high security. You have to go in and, and, and try to understand what that means in terms of making it secure. For example, enabling MFA, also restricting I'm going to talk a little bit about this on this next slide. In fact, maybe I'll just move to the next one and go with this because that's the exact next topic I was going to be talking about. Um, with something that we call, um, under this aspect here, where it's a asset management, and these are things for identify, but essentially what, you're, what we're discussing here is a little bit around access control. And one of the things that we employ at TechSoup is something called the, the principle of least privilege. And this is a very important concept for organizations. And sometimes it's called privilege access management. So the way that you can minimize the cloud is not to make everybody an administrator for your Google tenant or your Microsoft Office 365 tenant. You limit the amount of administrators and then you only provide the relative access or right to something that's required for them to do their role in their organization. For example, QuickBooks, for example, or in the cloud, like into in the cloud. There's sensitive information there, right? Like finances, but you don't make everybody in your organization a, an administrator of, of, of your online QuickBook. You, it's going to be the people who are in charge of finance. That's their role. And then what they may do is provide reports for you to read or read only access to certain aspects that relate to your job. So in the same way, if you think about that concept, when it comes to things like a Google drive, so you can protect Google. You can make sure that it, that it is secure with sensitive information. But you have to understand then how that works in terms of the configuration of it. For example, limiting access to those people with not only within your organization. For you, that's a control that's commonly found in Box and Microsoft and other places. You can create a folder to with nobody outside the organization. Only and only name specific people can access this information here. And then you took so guards it against that, but then also employing MFA on top of that will mean that basically it not only do you have multi-factor authentication, so only the people who have need to know that information, have access to it. You don't just create a shared drive in Google and then let everybody, and then take that link and share it to, to, with people and make that link externally accessible by anybody who has the link. That's the number one rule there that you'll see that when you go to share something, because Google and Microsoft, they want you to share things, right? Because they're, they want more people using their products. So you have to really consciously step back and say, okay, gosh, I'm going to be, it says, do I want to create a, a, a shared link? And anybody with the link can access this folder. No, basically just make it so that it only the people who have permissions in that structure of that, that file documents place. Uh, I hope that answered your question. So diving in a little bit to this, this is basically just another version of what was, what we saw before in terms of these different parts in there, basically. And so these are some other questions that are part of identify. I spoke about this a little bit, but asset management is a big one. If you don't know what devices are out there, you can't manage them. For example, if you don't know that there's somebody who's using, but, but you also have, because of that, you have to say maybe there's going to be some apps, some inventory that you, you don't have access to because somebody's using it outside of the IT department, some shadow IT, as they say, or they're using something like a personal device because they can log into a cloud system and. So you have to understand and also, but, but I think 
with asset management, part of it is knowing your applications, right? So when often an organization, some team will say, oh, I need a project management tool. And so what they'll do is they'll spin up a project management tool without telling the operations or IT department or whoever. And so as a result of that, then they become administrators of that. And then what can happen is, is that if they leave the organization, nobody knows exactly how, how to take over that account. You have to do, go through a whole bunch of work. So generally, if, in an organization, what you're going back to the privilege access management, we always make sure that there's a process to approve an application. It goes through a security review, and then we authorize the use of that application, and we make sure that somebody in IT could also be an administrator of that to that team, there be some attrition or something that happens where, or an event that occurs. And also so the IT department can govern and monitor how it's set up from a security perspective. The other thing is it's really important to think about a risk management strategy and governance. We talk about this a lot in IT and security is governance and a risk assessment and the risk management. From a business perspective, with all the stuff that I'm talking about, from a business perspective, this is risk management. And because there's all kinds of risks that organizations could face, whether it be natural disaster, changes in the market firms, economic forces things of that nature, all kinds of risks associated with people having too much information in their single point of failure and their limitations. So a lot of cybersecurity is really risk-based assessment and management. And by doing that, having proper governance over that, then you're essentially doing the right thing for your organization and, and also being stewards of that data. In terms of protect, this is where often does we spend a lot of our effort is basically protecting us. As you saw before in that slide where I show you the data of all this stuff that's getting hit tech soup, we really focus a lot on that. The other is security awareness. It's super important. Data security, making sure that it's protected, data loss prevention, and, and maintenance, making sure things are maintained. You know, like, how are we doing on time so far? Where are we at? We do okay. We're 40 minutes through. We've got a solid 15 minutes until we need to bring it all to a close. Great. Excellent. Then I'm going to basically just run through these because I went through this before, then I'll talk a little bit about what text out to fix have been played. Um, essentially, this is pretty straightforward, but essentially one of the things we do is that you mentioned this earlier was continuous uh, monitoring security uh, vulnerability views um, and also the detection process. So ensuring that we basically have ways to alert, notify when events happen. This morning, for example, I, I received some emails that I could see that one of my system admins was in making some changes to our DNS records, but it, I, I was able to see that and then look and make sure that was by an authorized person who had the religion that's part of the role to make those changes. And it wasn't done by, because somebody hacked into our Route 53 and AWS and, and started doing that. It's really important. We, we have, I have an entire, you know, and I take all those filters and stuff and I have filtering them. So that's just not no way it's because it get a lot of stuff gets generated. And we also have these windows that we can go in like portals where we can go and see everything at one place, like I demonstrated earlier. Response planning, super important is creating a um, security incident plan. And also understand what that, as part of that, you understand the communications, both internally and externally, that would happen as a result of an event. And then obviously, when you recover from something, you have to do an analysis, you have to do the medication, and then you have to do things that are proactive to keep it from happening again. Tech tips is to what we've done is we've taken these things and we've applied policies and created an information security policy document where we cover these things. And, and then we make sure that's in alignment and that lines up with NIST. So basically, like for taking that NIST 800.30, I don't, I don't have it memorized, but basically taking that, those guidance and then ensuring that we've got a template of policies for those. But there's some links, I think, at the, at the end of this presentation where you'll be able to see where you can get template link and then modify them for your own use. But especially we, for example, we basically have application asset management system. I spoke to that a little bit earlier. We also have, we do MDM, we use Intune to basically ensure that we have an inventory of our user devices and, and then we have policy-based governance. So we basically have things people can, can, cannot do with the data and we enforce that and people have to sign off in the employee handbook. These are the things you can do and not do with our data. And then also to document your infrastructure and document things. So, you, so it's there, but I mean, it's not just in somebody's head somewhere. I mentioned earlier protecting, I mentioned earlier that we have these web application firewalls, endpoint protection, encryption, multi-factor authentication, disaster recovery. We use, as far as this, we use cloud-based backups that are encrypted 
but they're not stored in the same place. So you don't want necessarily your backup to be in the same room as your, you know, your production data, because it defeats the purpose of something that's happened to that room, like a disaster or that environment or that system. It's always good to move things offsite, but we don't like people to have physical things offsite unless they're secured. We always recommend looking for a cloud-based uh, backup solution provider. And the huge security awareness frame is, is super huge because you can prevent a lot of stuff by just going using a program like Know Before, which is in our catalog to ensure that your users and your staff are trained. And I discussed earlier privilege access management. I went into some detail about that, but these are some, some principles for protection that we like to recommend. And then in terms of detecting, but once again, we have uh, this continuous vulnerability monitoring and assessment using Rapid7. Um, mm. We also use, we have data that comes, we use a SIM called Sumo Logic to actually move data into. We also use New Relic, which is one of our partners to help us understand what's going on with our infrastructure. And then through those tools, we have a learning and escalation protocol. So if something comes up and somebody sees it, they know exactly who to go to, to escalate it for investigation and to, and to identify things. And then also then that, if, if it's thought to be a security incident, then it goes to our, then the app goes to the incident response team, which has been identified in our response and in incident response policy, which is a fundamental aspect of having an incident response policy is to identify who's part of that incident response team. And that'll generally be somebody in, in, in our case, in TechSoup, somebody representing legal communications, IT and operations. Or response and recover, like you basically need to do incident containment, and you have to have a disaster response protocol and then the communication. And then you just need to do it. You should do a root cause analysis, find what happened, what was the gap, how did this occur? And you do that to prevent, basically so that you can learn in the future how you can improve. So this is part of that, that damning cycle they talk about in business about continuous quality improvement or being a learning organization, right? So we, the tech soup, we talk about that with our, with our communities. And so we try to walk the law when it comes to that. So essentially, I think, and I've got some resources here at the back, but essentially, I think at that point, I just wanted to walk through that because I want to provide enough time for questions. And I'm going to go ahead and stop my share and so that we can, we can get into some questions and discussion. Does that sound good, Eli? That sounds perfect. Excellent. I've got two questions in the queue, which means probably have enough time for a couple more. So keep throwing them into the chat and, and we'll keep trying to stump Michael. Come on. I dare you all. Let's try and do it. Question number one comes here, courtesy of Sean, who says, look, I'm a small scrappy nonprofit. We've got one person who's the in-house IT guru, but that makes us a little bit vulnerable. Things happen. Yeah. So they've talked a little bit about working with a managed service provider who might be able yeah. to step in and help do some coverage and start filling in some of those gaps that because no one person is an expert in everything. So the first question is, what is a managed service provider? Could you just give us a really quick sense of what that is for those for whom that's a new concept? And then what are maybe some of the pros and benefits of engaging one? And then I'll have a final question to keep you going. Great. But essentially a managed service provider is going to be a contracted IT resource for the organization. And Generally, these, you should do your own vetting with them, obviously, and, and, and get referrals and recommendations. But generally, the, it is, it, it, if an organization has only really as many times, but they don't want to hire more full-time equivalents for IT, somebody can, somebody, the IT person should be, could be responsible over that managed service provider or the ops or a, a leader within the organization to ensure that there's a plan. That they're not just doing what you tell them to, that they actually are following your guidance and your recognition and your work. I think one thing about it, one of the pros about it is that it does help in terms of cost management and also ensuring that you've got experts looking at things. But one of the cons of that is that they have to be, like anything else, they have to be managed. And as a result of that, it's important to know that they're going to do, depending on the quality of them, they could come in and say, you need all this stuff that's going to call your office with money, or they can come in and just do what they're told. I think it's good to sometimes have a third party provide a gap list of things. So have somebody else do an assessment, like tech impact or somebody do an assessment and then hire a managed service provider to come in and then help you remediate the gaps of that assessment and then go afterwards and have that assessment done again. Because if you have a managed service provider, sometimes do that, it's the same. 
I don't know what's wrong with my house. I'm going to call somebody out like a construction person. Like, what's wrong with it? But if they want to get the business, obviously they're going to do whatever they, they can to, to tell you like everything. And so if you need some help understanding what to prioritize, how to prioritize, that's where a third party who's not the service provider should probably be doing that. Interesting. So you recommend actually maybe pulling those things apart, which is get an assessment of what you think you need and then go for your quotes and see if, yeah. if what you're getting back is reasonable. Because as you say, and, it and could be very fair, different. They may have to, they may, I feel like they may have input too, but I think that it's just having just only one source of the truth there or what you think is the truth. If you, or if your IT person says, I, this guy's saying we need all this stuff and we don't need this stuff. I think there's other checks and balances you can put in place mm -hmm. there, especially when it comes to ensuring the security of the firm and making sure that they're employing the proper security practices because you're essentially going to be in a contract with them and you need to check the legal contract, the DPA, the data privacy agreement, and these things and have somebody oversee that because right. they, they could be liable and anyway, you have a cool, you have a cool responsibility at that yeah. point. And especially if you're a small, scrappy startup nonprofit, yeah. you may not have all those skills in-house to, to properly make that assessment. So that's why having that third party is really helpful, especially if you don't have that really technically minded person on your board. Awesome. I have got another question coming in here. And this one is coming from Randy, who's saying, disasters happen. You know, it's happened in Texas for sure. Floods, storms, snowfalls. It all happens. Any recommendations on how we might start the process of drafting a disaster recovery and preparation plan? Yeah, and it's important also to break out two things in terms of disasters and things like that. Because when in California, when I worked with the feedback system, we had to think about that, obviously, because there were potential for earthquakes. And, uh, and in other areas of the country, they have hurricanes and other sort of natural forces to prepare for. So there's sometimes the concept of contingency planning and contingency planning is, is sometimes goes hand in hand with the disaster response plan. The IT is going to be one component of that because you have to think about other things. Okay. How are we going to operate in a natural, a natural emergency, continue to operate what the contingencies, what if something happens to an individual who's the leader in the organization. So there's that sort of aspect of it. And that's a brick broken off to what we sometimes call disaster recovery and which is really about being able to understand that your data that is protected and, and then also that you can recover that data and you have the systems and you practiced it. So one of the, I think part of this is there's templates online at sans.org, S-A-N-S.org, basically where you can get templates for these policies. But I think conceptually it's important to break out those two things, continuous planning and data recovery, because there's going to be that data recovery will be part of that. If something happens to your, your server room or your IT infrastructure as a result of a natural disaster, but there's also be all kinds of other things that that can happen as a result. Awesome. And I wanted to also share a link to a toolkit oh, guide that TechSoup put together a couple of years ago that yeah. actually was specifically created with a grant in support of Texas nonprofit. Right. So it was created with people who know your pain. So we're coming in towards the end. People can throw a couple more questions at us, but I wanted to come here with Denise's Super tricky question for you, which is top line, high level. If I could do one thing to, to prevent or minimize the threat of professional hackers and breaches in my organization, what is that one thing? The obviously you can't choose between all your children. You love them all equally, but pick your favorite. That's the tricky one. That's the tricky one, right? I would say access control, like privilege access management. Because if you, if you don't have MSA, one of the, for example, a lot of things are going to be subject to somebody being, you get access to something like a phishing link. For example, if you clicked on a link and they were able to steal your email or figure out your username and password, it will be able to get into that system without MFA, without the, you having some MFA. I would say if you don't have MFA in your Google or your Microsoft tenants or what you're doing, then and you've got sensitive data there. I think you should, that would be like number one. That's low hanging fruit too. Hey, could you, you just you maybe decode one. MFA for those who aren't necessarily familiar oh, sorry, with the idea? Multi-factor authentication, sometimes dual, sometimes it's called two-factor authentication. It's what you do when you go to your bank and you need to then they send you a code on your phone or use an authenticator app. Essentially, what the factors are, multi-factor authentication to break it down is that there's two different things. It's something you have and something you know. Simple example. When you go to use your ATM card, you put the card in, that's something you have, and then ask for your code. 
that's something you know. Same thing when you type to go to a gas station, you, you put your card over gas, it asks you what your zip code is or something. It basically, it's something you have, it's something you know. Those are the two factors. Right. And, and if you were to start bringing that into your organization, what's the best way to bring that in? Do you use like a, a, a third party thing, like an Okta? Do you just go into Office 365 and like, turn on the, the, the new rule? Yeah. I mean, especially it depends on the organization and, and the level of uh, what the organization, the tools, but all tools these days, modern app tools will have a way to enable, the administrator can enable multi-factor authentication. If it's not, you should probably consider using a different tool. Especially, um, and, and let me paraphrase that, if, you, if that's where you're containing sensitive data. For example, your QuickBooks Online or something like that, you want to be able to use multi-authentic so that nobody can hack into your five-minute, you know, book. There'll be a setting under administration and security that'll say, enable, enforce. And you don't want to just enable it, you want to enforce it. Because that's different. You, know, you can enable it, but then it's not going to be enforced. So there's generally those two different steps. Oh, yeah, no, that's really helpful to get a sense of you think that's almost a deciding factor for a new service or tools to say, does it support this two-factor or multi-factor th authentication? So that's right. you don't have to worry as much about like, someone stole the password. You're like, yes, that's bad, but actually there's still other protections in place. We can assume that, but you can almost assume that basically passwords and also there's all kinds of other parts things that have to do with password policy. Uh, TechSoup has a password policy and we have a access protection policy that all that guidance is available, for example. Awesome. No, that's really helpful. Then with that, let's uh, bring this to a close.